I'll tell you a story from my life. I took a sabbatical and went to South America. I'd been practicing for, I think, 10 years. I decided it was, it was time to take a sabbatical. I wanted to learn to speak Spanish because I deal with a lot of Spanish patients and I never spoke fluently, so I wanted to take a year and do an immersion. In the meantime, I wanted to visit prisons and orphanages. Before I left, I had a bookkeeper named Polly, and I was I wanted her to take care of my books and if any bills came in. So I gave her $500, a $500 check to take care of anything that would be necessary for my bookkeeping the taxes at the end of the year. I flew to South America. I learned Spanish. I was traveling, staying in youth hostels, very low budget. And it came time to do the taxes. And I sent her an email from an internet cafe in Bolivia. And I didn't receive any reply. A few weeks later, I thought, oh, maybe she didn't get it. I sent her another one, no reply. And it's getting now closer to tax season. And it seemed to be amplified since I was so far away from home. It also seemed more acute because I was serving others. When she came to my house that last time, we talked about what I was going to do, and I, and I was assuming she was part of my team. She was going to be helping me as I was helping others. I sent another email and nothing. Finally, I said, okay, I have to find someone else to do the books. So I sent an email and found another one, another person who would be able to do the books. And then I sent Polly an email saying, send my bookkeeping to this other woman. A week later, I received an email from the new woman who was going to do the books named Tammy. She said, uh, I received the documents, uh, but I didn't receive the $500 check. Hmm, that's strange. So I sent an email to Polly saying, please forward that check that I gave you to do the books. No reply. Now my anger is starting to get a little bit more. Next week goes by, send another one, nothing. I finally get a reply from Polly. It said, I'm keeping the check as a storage fee. Stop harassing me. Yeah, it felt like she came out of the computer screen and just slapped me. And I'm, you know, a thousand miles away. How dare you? What are you harassing you? What are you, what are you? The whole thing was just, I was so incensed. I was so angry. Harassing you? What, like, what, are you, what planet are you on? What are you talking about? Uh, well, I stormed out of there and first thought, who can I, how can I destroy her? How can I, who was the friend that recommended this woman to me? Who was the, how can I get this woman back? How dare you? Well, this little problem overtook my life. I'm a thousand miles away walking on the streets of Bolivia trying to think about anything else but Polly. Polly has hijacked my whole brain, my whole system. Everything I think about is her and how to get back at her and how foolish I was for trusting her and how angry I am at the man for recommending her. And this was a, a nice Christian woman. So a week goes by. So I'm doing my declarations of forgiveness. I'm uh, trying to forgive her. I'm trying to forgive her as an act of my will. I forgive her in the name of Jesus. I forgive her. Uh, I return to her what is hers. I, I was saying all of the typical forgiveness prayers that I could say, but nothing seemed to be happening. A week later, I just remember I got up in the night 
to go to the bathroom, and I'm, I was feeling really peaceful. For the first time, I had slept well. I thought, huh, I'm sleeping really well. I, isn't there something I'm supposed to be thinking about? And then, bam, <laughs> on the way to the bathroom, I think about how I'm supposed to be angry at her, and it just, just like someone jumped on my back and started pounding me, this problem with Polly just hijacked me. And then I had trouble getting back to sleep. So my sleep was affected. I'm not, now I'm not enjoying my time so much on my sabbatical. And so after about a week, I am wishing harm to her. I'm wishing that the check will come back so at least I can be equal and equilibrated in my value. God, why is it? Why can't I not forgive her? What is the secret? I thought, by the way, I'm in South America going into prisons teaching people how to forgive. <laughs> There's an irony. There's an irony. I'm teaching, I'm teaching the prisoners how they can forgive because most prisoners, they're in prison because someone has hurt them and then they've gone on and hurt others. And I was even going into orphanages. As young as, as four years old, I was helping these kids to forgive the parents who had abandoned them. And I recognized, even at, I think, three and four, they knew what had been done, and they also knew that they didn't want to forgive. Very, very young, these seeds are planted. So I recognized I was on to something powerful, that I was just looking all the time at her, wondering about her, how dare she, how could she do this? And then I realized something was happening in my soul. What this meant to me was more than just the $500. There was a spiritual principle here. First of all, let's look at the $500. I'm, I'm in South America. I don't have, uh, I'm not working, so I don't have an income. I'm living off the savings that I have. $500 goes a long way in Bolivia. She was supposed to be helping me and I am relying on Polly to help me, and not so much on God. I was talking a good game about faith as I left my job and for a year and went to South America. But in actuality, my faith in God was lower than my faith in Polly. My faith really had been in the woman to take care of the finances. Like many of us, I would have said, all my money is God's money. Well, if she took $500 from God, that's a different problem than her taking $500 from me. But did I really believe that? I'd said that, but somehow it felt like she took it from me. So I had to start saying, God, that money is yours. If you want to get it back, you can get it back. But I'm not going to try to get it back. It's yours, and I've done what I could, I'm going to release it. I'm going to release this because this is not healthy for me. The other reason it's so painful is that this woman, who I would have considered a friend of mine and an ally, someone to help me, someone who had the vision that I had to go help the poor in South America, she did not think the relationship with me was worth $500. That's what hurts. That's what hurts. Someone has just put a value on a relationship with me, and it's actually less than $500. That's what hurts. Which definitely had a very powerful effect on my value, which also shows where I get my value. Where do you get yours? I wasn't getting my value from God. I wasn't trusting God for my uh, for my finances. I had to arrange all of this. It's up to me to make sure that I've got enough coming in to last this long. And without that $500, I might not be able to make it the year I was planning to spend there. Again, I have taken on this problem and believing I'm very responsible and all this financial foresight. I'm not praying. God, would you send me another $500? I'm looking at it from her. This is where I want it. Well, I also want it from Polly because I also want my value to go up. She had done something to decrease my value. 
So when I discovered that, that was an aha moment. And what do we do with those aha moments, those aha spiritual moments? It's an epiphany, and you say you have to start confessing. Father, I have not been trusting you. I have been looking to the world, to other people, to make sure that I have enough. That must be offensive to you. Please forgive me. Another thing that came to mind was the question I kept saying, I would never do that to anyone else. I would never do that to anyone else. I would never take someone's money, promising them I was going to do a service and basically steal from them. One of the ways we can develop forgiveness, it helps us with forgiveness, is something called compassion. She was a single mom. Yes, she went to church, so she was called a Christian. What she did was not a, a Christian thing to do, but she was considered a Christian. But she was a single mom, and obviously, from what she did, she needed $500. She needed it bad enough to do something that was dishonest. So I started to develop some compassion for her, the kind of person that would steal $500 to someone who paid you and left the country, that person, I was taking this as a, a indication of my value. Hmm, it's actually an indication of her value. So I could develop some compassion for her. And probably the thing that had the most power in allowing me to separate myself from her was when I asked myself that question, have you ever done anything like that? My first answer was absolutely not. I would never take anything from anyone. I felt like God was asking me the question, have you ever gotten into a relationship with someone where you were trying to get something from them and you had no intention of giving them what they wanted? Yeah, probably. Uh, those of us who are ambitious, we tend, whether it's in childhood, whether it's in adolescence, you tend to play the game. You, and whether it's attention you want or money you want or a date that you want, you pretend, you play a role so that they believe something that actually isn't true. And I believe most all of us have done that. And I want to pause right now, and I want you to ask yourself the same thing. Because when I started saying, God, I, I know now what it feels like to be betrayed, to have to trust somebody and to recognize that they had no intention of giving me what I thought I was getting. And I recognize at some level I have done this to other people. That was more healing than anything else that I had done. So let's pause, let's just pause right now. I want you to take a minute and I want you to think about that. Can you develop compassion? Can you look at where you have betrayed? And it may not be exactly the same. You may not have taken money from someone. But if you have been involved in a betrayal in your life, by confessing that and by looking at this person as someone who's also betrayed, there can be some healing there. So I'm going to give you a minute just to, to process with God, and then we'll let you discuss it with each other. When, it's, when he says he'll hand you over to the torturers, it's very much what I was experiencing and what anyone who's stuck in resentment and bitterness is experiencing. Our scriptures change that word to, I'll hand you over to the jailers, but it's a torture. It's a torment. I could not get away from that thought, not even out of a night's sleep. It would just, it would just keep coming back. It was as if it were a torture. And the second thing is when he says that we need to forgive from the heart, I was forgiving from the will just with my speech, but when I started having compassion on Polly, when I started recognizing myself as also a betrayer, 
in the same boat that she was, except for the grace of God, we are all capable in certain situations to do really bad things to other people. So by humbling myself, recognizing I had betrayed, and by developing compassion for her, wondering what would cause someone to act that way. This is also very useful for our parents when we have to, many of us have difficulty forgiving our parents even long after they're dead. But by having compassion, what did they get in their childhood? Did they have the resources to give to you? Because people can't give you what they don't have. So when we talk about um, justice, God promises those who forgive justice. He promises his children justice. We think about justice. Our justice system means if, if someone uh, breaks something or if someone uh, steals your car, justice would be that you get your car back. Justice is a little more complex than we typically think about it. Because when what, what Polly did to me was more than $500, wasn't it? How, how, how much is a night's worth, sleep worth? How much is one night worth? How, what about when your health? What is, what is the anxiety? What is the pain? What is the suffering worth that someone does to you? So when God promises that he will repay and that he will give justice, he's promising more than he's going to give me $500. He's actually promising that he is going to restore the years the locusts have eaten. He's going to restore everything. But that would require that I stop looking to Polly and start looking over to him. And it's through relationship that he's going to restore you can pray for the money, but he's also going to restore my value. I'm very valuable because I'm in Christ. He died for me. Most of us, that becomes a bit cliche, but perfect man dies so that I can have a relationship with the Father. Uh, changing a heart. He can give me positive emotions as I focus on his scriptures instead of this person. Philippians 4.13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4.19 My God will supply all your needs, all my needs, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So with his scriptures, he's saying, David, I'm responsible for your survival, for your finances, for your travel in South America or wherever. That's my job. I'm your father. Stop looking with anger towards someone. I'm going to give you back everything and I'm going to make you a man of peace. Because what I lost more than anything here, and those of us who have this forgiveness issue, what do you lose? Your peace. And along with your peace, you lose your joy. Right? There's no joy in looking over here, trying to wish harm on someone. That, that, it's just impossible. You find yourself, you're not laughing, you're not, uh, you don't find things amusing anymore. Because you take this person's value and it actually says something must be wrong with me for them to sell me out, betray me for $500. I must be bad. And so the anger turns inward, which is essentially depression. So focusing on God is helpful here. Oh, the one thing I want to talk about is justice. So the people that I've hurt... We haven't, we haven't gone there yet. We don't like to go there. We just say, God, when, when, would you forgive my sins? He said, I'd be glad to. Millions of dollars, I forgive the debt. Not a problem. Forgiven. Done. Yeah, we don't, we don't look back a lot. But there are some people with minus signs over here, and I've got a plus sign over here. Emotionally or whatever, maybe it's, maybe I, took their money, or maybe there are people who believe that in business or whatever, that they got the short end of the stick, that I wasn't as fair or equitable. I don't, I don't know, but it's certainly possible. You don't know the people that you've hurt, I can promise you. There could be any number of people. One of the people that I was thinking about this week 
was a woman when she got on the bus. It was actually a girl. I don't know. I was eight, 10 years old. But I used to tease her because she was overweight. I used to tease her, call her names. She was overweight. A few weeks later, she stopped riding the bus. Her mother had to drive her to school. If we think about it, probably most of us have those kinds of memories. We were not perfect children. We have to learn where the boundaries are. We don't know. I, I obviously needed some attention. I wasn't getting it at home. And this older girl, she was, I think, three years older than me, I thought it was funny. She would, you know, chase me around and try to smack me, and I was just having a great time. I thought it was really funny. And it was not, I think, until later I realized the, the damage that I had done. So, now what about that? Well, you can apologize, but you know what? So she, so her mother then also has to take her to school. So her mother is, is going to cost. Well, her sister now has an eating disorder. You see how our sin tends to cascade. It tends to spread much more quickly than we admit, than we'd like. And our society says, well, you know what? Yeah, but you just do some good and you can outweigh your bad. So I went to the soup kitchen and I, I complimented one of the homeless. And, and I actually gave some money to an orphanage. And I'm saying, oh, so it equals, right? See, that is one of the deceptions of the world, that somehow there's a big scale up there. And in my mind, these things equal. But when I complimented the homeless man, did that cascade through his generations? Unlikely. Unlikely. Unlikely that my soup kitchen ordeal did anywhere near the good that the damage did of those comments uh, for a couple of weeks on the bus. So Jesus comes along, and the good news is he says, I will forgive your sins. Not only will I forgive your sins, I will give these people justice if they will look to me. I will make it up to them the same way I make it up to you. I will give all positives. I'm going to redeem everything here. And guess what, David? You don't have to worry about it. I am going to cut this. You are forgiven. And if they come accusing you, you are forgiven. If you need to apologize, that will help them forgive. If you need to return money that was taken, that's helpful. But they can no longer say, he has a debt to me. Because Jesus comes along and says, I will pay your debts. Now, we don't understand that kind of salvation. We say, oh yeah, forgive my sins, and we never look back. Well, let's look back for a bit. Maybe this week you can do a little back looking like I did with the girl on the bus uh, when I was eight and wonder, wonder what happened back there. I'm not sure what damage I even did. For many of us, we have affected multiple people. And Jesus says, uh, would you like me to take care of that? Would you like me to forgive your debts? And then he says, I want you to forgive the people who owe you a much smaller amount. And by the way, I'm going to give you justice. I'm going to make it up to you. I'm going to give you the value that you want. You're looking to someone else for. And I'm going to not only do that, but everything that you have gone through, I am going to give you an anointing to bless other people with that. The reason I'm up here teaching about forgiveness is why. Because I've forgiven. I've gone through something that's difficult. I've looked at myself, and now I actually have a ministry helping people to forgive. What you do, what you make it through without bitterness is an automatic anointing for you to minister to others. This is not just for you. And that kind of good, now, that will cascade through generations. But this is not a big scale in the sky where we're trying to, to have your good outweigh your bad. That is, that's faulty logic. That's not actually understanding the effects of sin. The reason sin is so bad is that it, it starts wiping out things very, very quickly. It starts destroying people's psyches and people's souls, mind, will, and emotions. And with that, I'm going to stop. Father, we thank you for... Uh, the class today, we thank you for everyone who's come, and we ask that we would be like you, knowing our identity, so that we can forgive. We will focus on who we are and what you've given us, 
and we will begin confessing, we will begin humbly being honest before you. Lord, help us this week to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen.